John Shaw has an interesting passage where he tells his monks to keep watch over their minds, that that's the basic practice. And then he explains it, what he means by that, which is that try to catch yourself lying to yourself. It's an interesting idea. It's not just watching whatever comes up and being passive about it or accepting or equanimous. It means watching, looking for deceit, which is a different process entirely. Because meditation is basically a process of catching yourself doing things that you didn't notice you were doing, that you were ignorant of. And ignorance usually comes from two different sources. One is simply not paying attention, and the other is from trying to hide something from yourself. So you've got to catch yourself in both kinds of activities, one not paying attention to things you should be paying attention to, and the other is actively lying to yourself about something, pretending that you don't know something you do know or that you do know something that you don't. This is why when the Buddha sets out the the factors for the path, after he talks about the wisdom factors of right view and right resolve, he focuses on speech, what you say. Because what you say to others reflects what you say to yourself and vice versa. The two processes go together. And if you find that you can get away with lying outside, you're, it's a lot easier to start lying to yourself inside. This is one of the reasons why the Buddha was so strict about a person who feels no shame at telling a deliberate lie. He says, there is no evil that a person will not do. And we've seen that recently. But in particular, you want to look at yourself. Are there times when you would feel it's okay to lie, or even you're called upon to lie? And you have to look at your motivation, one, and you also have to look at your sense of the, what are the possibilities of speech, because the Buddha doesn't recommend that you tell the whole truth about everything. There'd be no end to how long we'd have to speak to tell the absolute truth about everything. So when there, when there are times, as he says, if it gives rise to greed, aversion, and delusion, either in your mind or the other person's mind, there are certain topics you want to avoid. And in avoiding them, you have to avoid them in a way that sometimes the other person doesn't catch you avoiding them, because then they'll know immediately what you're up, up against or what you're trying to do. But it, what this does mean is you have to be very careful about your speech, and that's all to the good. If someone is asking you something that would cause harm to somebody if you felt that that person knew, then you learn how to respond with a question. What do you mean? Or you learn how to phrase things in such a way they don't catch the fact that you're placing qualifications on what you're saying. These, these are possibilities that are there in human speech, and it's good to know them, both to catch yourself and to catch others. But the important thing is that you take care that nothing you say is going to be an untruth. That's what the precept is all about. And so there will be cases that try that resolve pretty considerably, but you have to learn how to stick with it, because the advantage of a precept is, as the Buddha said, you try to give universal safety to everybody. In other words, you don't know about how other people are going to take your information that you give. But you, know, you do know that you want to be responsible for what you say. It's the same as when you don't know if you're going to if you let somebody live, whether they're going to kill somebody else or not. But you do know if you kill them, they're, you're, you've committed a breach of the precept, a breach of your moral virtue. In other words, you've abandoned responsibility for what you are responsible for. This is where the Buddha focuses his attention.
be responsible for what you're responsible for. In other words, you don't do something that you know is against the precept. And at the same time, you don't tell other people to do things against the precept. He says you're harming them if you try to convince them that it's okay to break a precept or that they should break a precept. That's how he defines harm for other people. Now, you don't go around killing pe people. But the biggest harm you can do them is not to kill them. It's, if it's more harmful to tell them to do something unskillful, because that can cause them suffering for a long time to come, not just in this lifetime, but in many lifetimes down the line. Because we have to look at these precepts in line with the Buddhist teachings on the fact that we're all going to die sometime. We're all going to lose our relatives. We're all going to lose our possessions. We're all going to lose our health sometime. That's a normal part of being human. But we don't have to break our precepts. We don't have to develop wrong view. To break your precepts, to have wrong view, that's a huge loss, he said. The other losses that we tend to see as looming so large in our lives, loss of the people we love, he said, that's normal. That's a minor loss. We always have to keep that perspective in mind. Because if you start getting careless about your outside actions, you're going to be very careless about your inside actions as well. And you find it easier to fudge the truth to yourself. Because this is one area where you really should be totally open about what's going on in your mind. When you've done something well, you want to take note of that fact. You want to learn to distinguish what's skillful and what's not. Not just slough over everything as you practice. Because it's in seeing the distinctions that you understand the whole process of what the mind is doing, what it's fabricating. And these distinctions are very subtle. And if you don't learn how to be subtle in your speech, and don't learn how to be discerning in a subtle way about your precepts, it's going to be impossible to be subtle in your discernment about what your mind is doing, how it lies to itself. I mean, the primary example is the mind that gets distracted. Often the decision has been made quite a while before the distraction actually pulls you away. There's a part of your mind that's just lying in wait. But the least little slip in mindfulness, the least little slip in your alertness, and you're suddenly someplace else. But if you learn to look for the fact, okay, the distraction didn't happen just then, it was planned. Then you can begin to detect okay, when the planning starts, and you can nip it in the bud. And this is one of the most important lessons you can learn as a meditator, is to detect these underground decisions. And redo them before they actually take power and change where your focus is or change where your sense of who you are or where you are is. You've got to watch for these things. You have to be on top of things all the time. That's what it means to meditate. We're not just here relaxing. We're not just here to accept things. We're here to watch very carefully, see how the mind is an active process and how it's making decisions and making choices all the time. So we can be very careful about what those choices are, having a strong sense of where they will lead us. That's what mindfulness is for, is to remind us, okay, this kind of action leads to that kind of result. And so you have to recognize that as this kind of action and remind yourself, I don't want that kind of result. There are two words in Pali. There's otapa and atapa, and they're very closely connected. Otapa means a sense of compunction, realizing that if you do X, it's going to have bad results, so you realize, I, just, I really don't want to do that. And Thai, they define it as kind of a shrinking away or as a, a fear of evil, a fear of the evil that would come from your actions. Atapa is ardency. In other words, you realize, okay, these actions could lead to bad consequences, so I've really got to work hard so I don't do that. 
these actions lead to good consequences, I've got to work hard so I can give rise to them. The two qualities go together, compunction and ardency. We tend to miss that connection in an English translation. But you do have to have a strong sense that you are responsible for shaping your experience, so you've got to be open and above board with yourself about what you're doing and be really earnest in doing things well. It's this earnestness that translates into truth as a meditator, being earnest in watching yourself. So you can catch the mind lying it to, its, to itself, you begin to realize all the layers that are going on in the mind, layers of discussion, layers of decision, you can begin to pry them apart. That's genuine discernment. We like to think that discernment is totally confined in the words of the text. All you have to do is realize, okay, this is inconstant, that's stressful, that's not self, there you are, you've done the job. That's not the complete job. You kind of pry things apart, see where you're lying to yourself. Then you use these teachings on inconstant and stress and not self to test the truth of what you have to say to yourself. Because the stress, especially, is there to warn you. You may be lying to yourself again and again and again, and lying to yourself about the stress. But when you're honest about the stress, then you can do something about it. So just seeing the stress is, is not the end. You've got to realize that there's a connection to what you're doing. And it's escaped your attention, either because you weren't looking or because you were hiding it from yourself. So as John Cha says, keep watch over your mind. Watch it with a slightly skeptical eye. And this is the same principle we use in, in everything. I was talking to an athlete the other day, and he was talking about if you really want to be good, you have to maintain that intention to come out on top all the time. There's some people who are just simply proud of the fact that they're professional athletes, and then that stops right there. They're glad to be playing in the league, and they never shine because they're content with only that much. But if there's something inside you spurring you on to be, you want to be something better, then you have a chance. It's the same with a meditation. There has to be something spurring you on, and it's the perception of the fact that whatever pleasure you've got is inconstant. Some of the things you're doing are causing stress. You're trying to control things that you can't really control. That's what not-self is all about. You've got to learn how to see these things the way you've been lying to yourself, and then you can do something about them. You don't stop there. I told you the story about the person who was writing a letter to John Fung one time, talking about how he practiced insight meditation in daily life, just trying to notice whatever. Like when he was watching TV, notice how things are in constant stressful, not-self. And John Fuhrman told me to write back to him. He says, don't blame those things out there for being in constant stressful not self. Look inside and see, okay, what is it in the mind? The one who's calling them names, okay, what is it doing? When you can begin to see the deceits of your own mind, that's when you start having genuine discernment. And when you have that motivation that you don't want to suffer. That's what allows you to go beyond the deceits and see through them, because some of them are very comfortable lies. We lie in certain ways because it makes us feel better. Well, you we have to learn to peer into these things. Now, this doesn't mean being down on yourself all the time, just being a little skeptical about what the mind is telling itself about itself, asking some questions, but being persistent in asking the questions. And something good is sure to come from that. 